Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so this will be slightly different. It's um, focusing more upon um, archaeology and uh, medicine uh, as a concept in the later medieval period. Um, oh, let's see whether this works. There we go. Um, so first I'm going to outline uh, what hospitals are and the nature of medieval medicine in particular in the later medieval period and, and how, how we can, as archaeologists, see it. Um, then I'm going to go through some examples uh, using my own focus, which um, <clears throat> for, for looking at medicine and health, uh, it's usually done by osteologists looking at skeletal remains. Um, or sometimes by archaeobotanists looking at the plants. Um, I'm neither of those. I, <clears throat> I study architecture and um, aspects of material culture, so I'm coming at it from a, a kind of different perspective. Um, so I'm going to kind of engage in those ideas of, of buildings and space and what, what the things we find on these sites tell us about what they're actually trying to do, and then finish up with a... Uh, sort of a discussion on the nature of what community is as a healing process um, because I think it's it's an area that we we often forget about um, medicine in this period um, so hopefully this will um, open some minds towards what what medical practice actually felt like for for many people who were using these sites First off, it's important to define what a hospital is in this period. Um, they're seen as sites that are dedicated to the care of the elderly, the infirm, poor people, the sick, those that are traveling, um, usually poor travelers, um, or they're on pilgrimage itself on that spiritual journey to specific sites around England and Europe more generally. They're sites which embody the seven comfortable acts of Christ, although from my work, I can only really see six of them. There's an argument about um, one of them, and I'll get to that um, in a second. But definitely six of these are very clearly obvious in pretty much every hospital. I'll also say now that I'm focusing particularly on England and Wales, um, the hospitals there, um, because the, the the way they're constituted is is slightly different to the way that other hospitals across Europe work potentially related to the way in which the Normans come over and insert a, a veneer of French and Norman concepts or visible practice onto existing Anglo-Saxon practices. And in this case, the Anglo-Saxons are utilising uh, land as a means of supporting those that can't support themselves. And the Normans sort of transform this into... Uh, using hospitals as a title for a very similar practice. The seven comfortable acts are, as they are on the screen, feeding the poor, they're clothing the poor, bringing drink, housing wayfarers, visiting prisoners, which is the one that we can't really see, mainly because it's very difficult to see that process. Um, they're nursing the sick and burying the dead. What should be striking at this point is given that what we usually associate hospitals with, which is nursing the sick, the vast majority of the focus of these sites is actually not on sickness at all. It's on people who can't support themselves, in particular the poor and wayfarers, and sick is, is only one aspect of it. These sites linked concepts of religious charity, medical practice, public health and spirituality into compounds that were designed to be in theory healing venues and they're utilizing a multitude of different strands to to, uh, to achieve that in total for my uh, phd which this works kind of based on and then some some extra stuff that i'm i'm still thinking about there's at least 1,200 medieval hospitals in England and Wales dating between 1066 and 1547. Uh, 1547 being chosen because that's when Edward the Seventh uh, signs an act which closes all, fun all 
institutions that utilize a chantry function, i.e. praying for the souls of the dead. And that's one of the primary aspects of um, medieval hospitals that, that supported their charitable function. This means that in terms of religious institutions, the medieval hospital probably constitutes one of the largest groups of religious institutions outside of the parish church. Um, there's much more uh, medieval hospitals than there are monasteries, friaries, and potentially the military orders and nunneries put together. Um, but there's high fluctuation in their numbers. It starts quite small. Um, it reaches its peak just before the Reformation in the period between about 1500 and 1530, where there's about 600, 650 medieval hospitals acting at any one time. But when I looked at the numbers, there's actually quite a lot of turnover in those numbers. There's lots of sites appearing and then disappearing um, over that period. And uh, the average lifespan of a medieval hospital is probably little more than 100 years. Um, to put it in uh, kind of an example of this, it, there's a lot of uh, sites in Cornwall that you can see. Um, almost every single one of those is noted from one document in 1303, I believe. It's an inventory of the, the holdings of the duchy. Um, and they, they mentioned these sites once. We don't know when they start. We don't know when they end. And several of them are only caring for about three people. Um, and that's all we know about them. We often break these uh, groups into different categories like arms houses, uh, leprosaria, looking after those with leprosy, infirmaries. Uh, um, but actually, um, when we look at them, these aren't massively helpful distinctions, especially from an archaeological perspective. Uh, much the focus is on things like leprosy because uh, archaeologically it's visible in the skeletal evidence, which means that we can tie the skeletal remains to those that are residing, but in general, 60% uh, of them seem to be focused or have a primary care of the poor in general, um, and only 25% focus on leprosy. And that number is heavily weighted towards the first half of the later medieval period between 1066 and about 1400. You get uh, increasing, uh, a decreasing number, sorry, a decreasing number of leprosy hospital foundations from that period onwards um, and you, you don't really get many in the late 15th and 16th centuries. When I looked at these sites I realized that one of the main problems was that historically we discussed and we focused on these sort of distinctions between the different sites and who they're caring for but when we've looked at them archaeologically we still try to fit them into these um, these different categories. Um, but when I started looking at the sites, I noticed something about how they are actually set up and established, um, which I'm going to come on to later. I'm now going to discuss medicine in the medieval world um, relatively quickly. It's a development of Galenic medical theory. It's, it's very focused upon concepts from Aristotle, developed by Galen. Um, and... We, we see the use of things like religious law to control the way in which it's taught. Um, we see most of the focus that we can see historically coming through religious institutions, the use of the colleges. Um, and a lot of the hospitals, in fact, almost all the hospitals have close connections to religious practice. One of the key things to remember is that their focus in medicine was not on diagnosis. They're not attempting to work out why you're ill. They're attempting to work out your prognosis, what's going to happen to you in the long term. The, the main focus is on, on dealing with the, the long term impact of your illness. And as such, what they're looking for is assessing, are you essentially, are you going to die? If you are going to die, are you going to die a pure spirit? If you're not going to die, what impact is that going to have on you as a person being able to live in uh, the general medieval world? And is that going to impact others in a negative manner? What we often see, because there's this strong religious focus, that a lot of people focus on the spiritual aspects that we see in a lot of these texts um, over the physical man uh, manipulation of health. 
there's a focus on whether any of these treatments kind of work and this sort of assumption that a lot of the things they're doing is sort of you you pray for someone to get better um, and then you sort of shrug your shoulders and carry on but that's missing a, a fundamental aspect of how these sites are actually working and I, I note i noted at the top there this thing called non-natural environments this is a galenic theory where um we they they try and create spaces in which people don't feel negative components in their life they don't feel negative emotions um, it's an attempt to remove things like anger fear especially fear of death from from people's lives and allow them to focus upon positive aspects which actually when we we think about it is kind of, is is a focus point of modern medicine many of the texts uh things like Hinein ibn Ishak's Isagog, when, uh, which is one of the ways in which Galen's theories on non-natural environments gets into uh, medieval Europe. We see this focus on aspects like food and contemplation and prayer. John Murfield, he's a canon of a, uh, at a hospital in the 15th century in London. He wrote the Bre Breviarium Bartholome. Um, he was at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. Um, in which he states out the application of non-natural environment theory um, in medical practice. He has uh, recipes for, for different foods that can be used to, to assuage different um, ailments. It has herbal remedies, many of them focused upon um, everyday uh, plants that are found in gardens, uh, along hedgerows, things like that. And it doesn't really go into anything like surgery. It doesn't really go into some of the more um, interesting and, and focused upon aspects of medicine from the medieval period. Um, and in fact, that aspect of medicine is pretty much only focused upon elites within medieval society um, because they're the ones that can afford to pay the physician to come up with um, something to help them because of the potential risks that are involved in them doing it. Um, physicians don't really last long if they're prescribing quite extreme elements uh, to people's lifestyles that may end up um, not helping them. The last image I've got on there is a, a recipe, an illustration for crane and wine from the Liber de Regimen Sanitatis from the uh, Salerno Medical School, probably the most famous medical school in medieval Europe. Um, and it's it's um, stated to cure um high blood pressure it's in it's uh, part of regimens given to people um, who seem to suffer from high high blood pressure or, uh, in their terms it would be um, an excess of of blood which actually crane crane meat does actually do it's a dark animal meat um, it's quite good at relieving things like blood pressure but there's a warning within this text in particular which says uh, do not imbibe too much or for too long a period for it encu uh, in encourages a sense of melancholia upon the patient, which seems quite odd to, um, until someone, um, a food, food nutritionist uh, pointed out that crane meat actually, um, if you eat too much of it, gives you constipation, which um, in my mind would cause melancholia in pretty much anyone. When we look at the archeology span for this, um, actually it's really limited it's it's very limited finding evidence of medical practice uh most of it focuses on focuses upon the skeletal evidence looking at things like ulcers and diseases other health markers nutrition um in particular things like uh food uh food stresses in the teeth um leprosy there's increasing um examination of of Yersinia pestis um as well and things like size, so a lot of hospital excavations looking at cemeteries have, have assessed the kind of height differences between people and the, the bone development and things like that. But if we look for medical practice more generally, uh, there's an excellent uh, paper written by the late Jeff Egan who, who looked at this, and really nothing much has changed um, from my exploration of this. Um, 
there's a few sites where we have copper alloy or lead sheets that are near joints, um, some of which appear to have um, fibrous material underneath them and around them, which may mean they're being bandaged onto these joints. Um, not really clear why, but potentially for sort of healing purposes. There's the use of religious implements like ampullae, so uh, lead, uh, holy water containers and papal bullae found within burials, potentially uh, people trying to take uh, signs of their spirituality with them when they go to the gates of heaven. There's a few cases of urinals. There's there's a couple of fragments found from a, a site that I'm going to talk about later, St. Mary's Spittal in London, but a lot of them are actually quite late and may be associated with the post-Reformation use of the site um, as sort of workshops and um, business quarters for, for people. There's been some look at medicinal plants, and I am going to mention them in a second when I go into a bit more detail. Um, there's been a jet bowl found that Jeff Egan as, uh, associated with a medi medieval treatise um, about pregnancy. Um, the water from a jet bowl was supposed to kind of help assuage labour pains. But it's best summed up by Jeff Egan's comments about the barber surgeon's chest on the Mary Rose, um, which when you actually looked at it were very domestic in nature, wooden handles, which won't survive, of um, iron implements like saws and knives, a series of ceramic jars filled with things like peppercorns, again, very domestic. Um, and and most of it is, is very difficult individually to separate from a, a general domestic setting. And this is one of the things I think is really important to bear in mind. Health in the medieval period is something that is, is part of the domestic sphere. You don't go looking for medical help if you're poor, um, mainly because you can't afford it. Um, outside of the household, you're utilising household remedies, you're utilising the knowledge, you're trying your best. When you can't help yourself, that's when we start to see some of these other practices in things like medieval hospitals. I'm going to go through a couple of sites because it's important to highlight um, a couple of factors about the way these sites function. So this is St Mary's Spittal in London. It was first founded in 1197 as a small chapel. Then it's refounded in 1230 in this uh, sort of T shape um, and it goes to 1539. It's one of the largest medieval hospitals in England. Um, it ends up looking uh, catering for about 180 people at its maximum. When we when people have previously looked at the architecture for medieval hospitals, they've argued that these sites are are often sort of randomly or not not very coherently established. There seems to be no order to them. We assume that they should look like a monastery, and there's certain cases where they do. This is one of the kind of clearest ones. However, there are a few oddities about it. Um, the site doesn't have a tran uh, has a nave. It's only got these two very large transepts, which were originally utilised to house um, the the residents. That it, what we call in the in the literature they're called inmates. Um, mainly to try and get away from this idea that they're patients, because they're not patients in the traditional modern hospital sense. Although I kind of argue that they are now. Um, they're there's this very clear cloister, which is associated with the Augustinian canons who look after the spiritual side of, of the hospital activity. And then um, you have the, the sister's house, which is attached to the inform infirmary on its north side, where between six and 12 women were looking after those 180 up to 180 residents on one of the main roads. Um, out of London, it's just outside of Bishopsgate, um, so sort of kind of north northeast side of central London, and but there's a clear kind of organisation here to this site, and and it's usually a, a kind of argued that this is because it has such a clear community of canons there, and it, it holds quite an important place. I'm going to come back to St Mary's Spittal later. Next is St Mary Ospring. Um, another site that I examined for my PhD and um, it doesn't seem to be as closely matched this like, kind of monastic ideal. We have the church in the sort of bottom right with a, um, a guest house component, potentially areas where the, the, the kind of staff were living. 
there's a common hall attached to its west end heading northwards, um, which does have some similarities to St. Mary's Spittal. Then there's a close um, above the chapel, which potentially there's the, the excavation didn't manage to see much of it, but there's evidence that this might be a cloistral range with uh, what's called a camera regis. This is a royal, um, a royal apartment used for travellers along the road from Dover to London. And uh, the kitchen is attached to the north side of the common hall. But if we 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 kind of stop looking at the, the specifics of the architecture and actually look at the way this is zoned, this zones exactly the same as uh, St. Mary's Spittal, a chapel with some form of cloistral range or close to the north of it, a common hall where the infirmary, the, the, the inmates would live on its west side. Um, and then the kitchen sort of sat between these two areas with guest quarters to the sort of the east of that and a more sort of yard like functional area to the the west of that this is the next site uh, bartholomew's bristol um it's a little bit harder to see the the excavations here were enclosed by a lot of buildings they're just uh just the west of the river Froome, right on the outside of uh medieval bristol the sort of inner city of medieval bristol so it's now heavily densely occupied by buildings but when they reconstituted its plan through the various different information they had um they showed this sort of chapel with uh an infirmary area to its west side it's slightly lopsided because it's built on the uh the the main building with the porch chapel and infirmary that's a, a, a 11th century 12th century um, merchant's house that was given over to the hospital to house um, to house it in its first phase and they retain majority of this sort of uh, this um, this house uh, this hall building F wasn't very wasn't excavated very much there was a few little um, test pits into it but it does appear to be the area where the staff lived the north of that building E is a kitchen and refectory area and there's quite a heavy structure to it in one of the phases, which suggests there's a dormitory above it for at least part of its time. Then buildings B, C and D are a latrine, a granary house and a water house where the water flow um, comes through. And then building A is the, the women's dormitory, uh, beyond which is the burial ground. With a, the eye of faith, um, and I go into this in more detail and other things, but um, we can sort of see a similar process going on here. A courtyard predominantly associated with the males and with um, the, the sort of staff and guest house. And then another close, we could call it, although it's not enclosed, but it's creating an area of kind of courtyard, which is more functional and more associated with women, creating the sort of staggered space. Um, throughout the, the sort of area. There's a couple more I'm just gonna quickly mention. Um, St. Giles at Bruff uh, is an interesting one. It's a site with uh, associations with leprosy. The building in the foreground is the chapel just to the north of that. Uh, so to the right-hand side of that image is a guest house and staff house. The road that goes across the bridge goes through the middle of the compound. Um, and then on the other side seems to be kitchens, dormitories garden areas for the residents. St Mary Magdalene Partney's uh, a, an interesting one because it's again kind of out in the middle of nowhere on but it's on a, a rise over an area of marshland and water next to a major road leading north towards Lincoln. It's a, a subsidiary cell of Bardney. Um, it has quite an interesting burial record which I'll discuss in a second. The last two are um, St Giles at Norwich and Brown's Hospital in Stamford. There's, if you if you do any reading on medieval hospitals, there's often this discussion or dialogue between the idea of religious and secular hospitals. Um, this slide is merely here to point out that when you actually look at the way that the these two concepts are constructed in the medieval period, they're almost identical. They have chapels in the same place. They have dormitories in the same place. And they have um, areas where the warden or the master of the house will be located. 
the chaplain's dormitory, the area where the kitchen is, they they match almost perfectly uh, between the two, which raises this idea of why are there, why are we so focused on these distinctions? Why does that help us when we try and understand what these sites are doing? So what I wanted to do is rethink the whole idea of how hospitals work and how medicine, the concept of medicine functions. This is Fountains Abbey, very famous uh, Cistercian Abbey site. The, the area I want to focus on is the area between the infirmary hall and the cloister, which bang in the middle, you have the abbot's house. Benedict, when he came up with the rule, the rule of Benedict, and from which the Cistercians get their rule, he was very clear on what happens to people who are unable to fulfill the hours of the monastic world. They must be removed from the community as a whole, placed into a separate entity, the infirmary, supported, made better. They're often given privileges that the other members of the house don't get, such as being able to eat meat on uh, more regularly, to have wine, to have fires in the infirmary, to warm themselves. They have their own separate chapel to remove their need to go and join the rest of the community. And then when they return, they must go to chapter and they must pay penance. They will be given a penance to do. So in essence, you're being punished for being ill. My argument about this, and, and it's been made by others as well, is this idea of monastic lives were supposed to be difficult. They're supposed to be hard and challenging. What you don't want are people who appear to be not fulfilling the role that is required of these people and being able to get away with it. So you're punished for not being able to support yourself in in your life you must go through a process of of rehabilitation both physically and also spiritually and what i find really interesting is that albert's house sits as an intermediary in this space between the infirmary and the rest of the, the dormitory and the rest of the, the the religious space the abbot is there as a sort of guardian over people from the the main cloister moving to the infirmary when they're not supposed to and those from the infirmary moving towards the cloister um in a sort of uh, reciprocal manner. They're being controlled through that use of space, not by doorways, but by the physical presence of authority. So our focus needs to be more on this idea of the wider aspects of, of health. We see in um, hospitals, a range of religious items, things like pilgrim badges, crucifixes, um, there's also keys for lockers, which um, doesn't sound like it's for religious items, but most of the medieval hospitals which we have any information about state that you, you give up your items whilst you're in the place and you wear a, a, commun a habit um, that is part of that community. Um, so this is kind of evidence of that locking away of your outside person and the, the gaining of this much more religious person. These sites frequently made prayer um, a, a fundamental part of the day. Um, prayer for, for the benefactors and so on and for each other was a key component. And these religious items highlight these, these elements of, of spirituality. There's also things like uh, paper prickers. So there's, there's literacy going on, some writing. We have way bowls, mortars and pestles, smoothing stones all elements that could be associated with things like measuring medical material, cleaning, um, hygiene. We have a, a range of wooden and ceramic vessels from uh, a lot of sites. There's, there seems to be quite a lot of bowls and jugs um, found along sites, especially things like St. Mary's Spittle. There's a lot of jugs there. Um, and the wooden bowls they have are marked in various different ways. We're not sure what the markings mean, but they may be personal. Um, markings specific diets potentially um a lot of the the evidence especially with things like the animal remains there's um low nutritious portions there's um bone splitting there's variation between the sites so uh st mary spittle um there's more cattle at st bartholomew's there's more sheep but there's increasing evidence of the fragmentation of bones the split Marrow, potentially marrow extraction, um, increasing evidence over the period of the use of poorer quality meats, 
whilst at the same time where there's been full of a zoo archaeological study there's very limited signs of things like burning which means that they're boiling and stewing things rather than roasting if we add this in presence of bowls the the use of a lot of jugs there that could in, imply that they're um they're creating kind of large bulk foods that are healing and nutritious but also quite cheap to make uh, eating separate portions um, for individuals that require specific nutritional needs. Um, there's also, uh, from St. Mary's Spittal, quite a lot of pipkins, so quite small sort of roasting pans or cooking pans for braziers, which um, there's potentially, the, the, the food they're eating isn't necessarily of the level that you'd expect those for. Archaeobotanically, um, we have the presence of things like henbane, dill, mustard, fennel, mint, these are all naturally occurring and we don't have large amounts. There's also not been sustained archaeobotanical investigation of these sites. So it's very difficult to tell whether there's little evidence or we're not looking for the evidence. But what we can see more generally, adding those into things like pollen um, and other seeds that we get, we can see the presence of things like ponds, trees, orchards, scrubland, and cultivated or semi-cultivated land like gardens, um, presence of apple, cherry, damson, plum, hawthorn, blackthorn, hazel, and elderflower. So we have these sort of small horticultural elements that could be used to create food. They could be used to create some of these more sort of everyday household remedies using plants that are sort of naturally occurring around them with some mild cultivation. But also this sort of more open space, a lot of these sites are focused around urban areas. They're focused on the outskirts of big cities and towns. So these are larger areas than you'd normally associate with sites. Um, and I'd argue that they're trying to create at least some space for contemplation of the natural world. Um, the utilization of that sort of natural world within in within the, the the daily cycle components of prayer and contemplation so focused upon supporting those who have acknowledged issues in their lives or are sponsored by their communities these aren't necessarily open they're not accepting everyone there are quite strict rules about who they'll let in. Um, many of them require you to pay money to go in or to provide some form of um, sort of uh, um, mat uh, material response for that payment. But they are quasi-monastic. They almost all follow elements of a religious rule. They're all isolated from the wider world. Um, they all have compounds that kind of tie them away. And they seem... and and other authors have kind of noticed they seem to be isolating themselves away from the wider world, um, stopping that wider world impacting them and from them impacting the others. There's this sort of understanding that these things like poverty, sickness, leprosy, they're all dangerous things. And so is things like traveling and pilgrimage because they're strangers. Strangers provide this area of danger to people. We see prayers for benefactors, evidence of a, a daily component of the regimen of the day. Um, so we can argue this is kind of a precursor to the Chantry Chapel, the way in which purgatory is um, developing within the medieval period, this concern for what's happening to the soul. In other words, the prognosis of the general, of, of people. There's also evidence that hospitals for leprosy also included hospitality for pilgrims and travellers as as standard um, in many cases. So we have um, the site of St. Mary the Blessed Virgin at Maiden Bradley, who petitioned Rome in the 1330s for, for monetary assistance because they were having to house and feed travellers coming through the Selwood Forest when they didn't have the funds to help them. These are people willingly going into a leprosy hospital for... a night um, for food um we all have the official right to beg on the road there's they're often located quite close onto roads at gates st giles at uh, brough 
um, is on a bridge and there's um, burial evidence of leprosy there. So our concepts of stigmatism and quarantine aren't matching up with the record. Um, I would argue that they're using hospitals to treat social ailments. This is why poverty sites that are uh, focused on poverty are so prevalent in the medieval hospitals, but the leprosy hospitals and the poor uh, arms houses and hospitals for the poor look the same. It's because they're treating them similarly. If you acknowledge something, you can be treated in a spiritual and physical environment. If you don't, then you're dangerous. And that's why we get the rules about uh, lep uh, lepers out on the street, why we get rules about the poor on the street. Coming on to the communities for the dead, um, we increasingly see some diversity in the way that burial evidence goes. Uh, this is the cemetery of St. James and St. Mary Magdalene at Chichester, which is a uh, hospital for leprosy. Um, and we, the argument is that the hospital cemetery expands from the southwest into the northeast, and over time it becomes more diverse um, alongside the change in the, the hospital itself, which begins to take women. Um, and then be more focused on poverty rather than leprosy as leprosy seems to die out over uh, from about the mid 14th century onwards. But the thing I'd like to highlight is there's still female burials, some of whom have leprosy, some of whom don't in the earlier phases. And we know from, uh, from written records that some of the people are choosing to be buried here, are paying the hospital to be paid to be buried at, uh, in a leprosy hospital cemetery, which again implies that the sort of the stigmatism of these sites may not be quite what we're thinking. That there's something else potentially going on. At Partney, um, it's a really nice case. All the burials to the south of that path are males between the age of about sixteen and forty-five. To the north are children, women, and men. Um, and the, we, we seem to have this kind of clear distinction between the, the staff of this hospital and the, the men who were looking after the, the, the chapel for the Abbey of Bardney on the south side and locals or travellers who died whilst residing at this site buried to the north. Um, and we, we see this kind of element of hospitality. Um, there's not a large population uh, near Partney in the medieval period, um, but they must be choosing to because the parish church is quite a way away. So they're choosing to come to this site or the, the residents are providing hospitable charity in the form of burial to those that are passing through. There's also evidence of hospitals providing burial support during periods of crisis and catastrophe. Um, leprosy is the most sustained disease crisis of the medieval period, arguably, or at least what we can visibly see. But there's also evidence of dealing with uh, potential famine or short term disease outbreaks at St. Mary Spittal. And at the Hospital of St. James at Thornton Abbey, uh, there's recently been found evidence of a Black Death mass grave. This is St. Mary Spittal. Um, it has 175 large burial pits, ranging from um, four, three or four people up to a maximum of 40, uh, 46, I think, in one grave. Um, in total, there's several thousand of the burial population, um, which amounts to about 11,000 um, in total for the, the whole period of the medieval hospital. Um, a good sort of 20 percent of them seem to be buried in what would be classified nowadays osteologically as mass graves but they don't date to the period of the Black Death. In fact, the period between about 1250, I think in the astrological report, about 1250 and 1400, there aren't any signs of mass graves at all at the site. These seem to be catering for periods of disease and famine outside of that period. And it seems to be kind quite concentrated, potentially um, indicating that these sites were areas where intercessionary burial was really important. People who were deemed to have problems or who, who were suffering, who may be going through some component of purgatory, were being buried purposefully um, because burial costs costs money. Um, and parish, parish churches were very, very particular about letting burial details leave them. They didn't want parishioners to be buried elsewhere. Um, 
so so there's a lot of kind of argument going on between these sites but the fact that we have so many being buried here seems to show them as as this kind of intercessory place for people who may have suffered um this is further supported by st james at thornton abbey um there's only three black death mass graves that we have in england um the ones at East Smithfield are very interesting because there's lots of individual burial plus long slit trenches where people are placed individually within. There's no stacking. There's no crossover. Um, the one at Hereford Cathedral has evidence of Eusinia pestis, but it's not being written up, but it looks a bit more like a traditional mass grave of people being stacked. Um, St. James at Thornton Abbey is the only rural example that we've got, and they're all laid out individually in one large um, hole. It seems to be a modified quarry pit. Um, a range of people, um, men, women and children with the presence of Eusenia pestis um, shown with a later cemetery cutting through them um, where uh, around this hospital of St. James, which is just on the outskirts of the, the abbey itself, there are another 175 individuals who were part of a sort of more normal population um, around the chapel. They were predominantly men older men again sort of 18 to 45 plus a lot of very small children young children up to the ages of about 10 and then this was a, a more mixed population of later insurgents uh, martin, we're, martin we're oh, running out of time are you nearly finished yeah i've got uh two more slides okay i'll be i'll be done very quickly um Given the role hospitals were intended to fulfill, it's surprising the limited engagement in why people chose to be buried there. Um, the afterlife and prayers for the soul are a fundamental part of their daily activity. They're a key component of gaining charitable benefaction and donation. And there have to have been choices being made by people to be buried within the bounds of these hospitals, which weren't residents. There, we, There's clear indication that some of these aren't, and we can't assume that everyone that is were were residents of these sites so i think it's really important to view these sites in general as places of healing and support the physical and spiritual world were intimately tied together in the way that they viewed health and how they should be and i think that plays a really important role in why people choose to be buried here as a as support for their own soul curing their soul um, through the process of burial this concept of prognosis um, i think is really important here this medical practice of applying prognosis to the soul of those who are dead and utilizing burial in hospitals as a means of gaining soul uh, gaining prayers for their soul from a charitable institution whose function was essentially um, to create these prayers and support uh, people who couldn't look after themselves those that are buried often have similar disease markers, poorer health or separation within burial populations in a way that these people are being separated in living lives um, by these communities being kind of separated away from other people because of their potential danger, but also the danger that the outside world poses on them. And the dead are directly engaged with by the rest of this community. They're, they're using burial as a charitable component. It's one of those seven comfortable acts. And so they're utilizing burial, they're utilizing health, environment, the sense of community, religious aspects, all as um, as aspects of, of healing for those both living and dead within these hospitals. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of stress those components. Um, I didn't get onto the, the nature of good intent and bad result, um, but there's some interesting cases of that. 